Good morning, good morning. We're super glad you're with us today, whether you're here in person or watching online. My name is Sam, Sam Merriman to be particular. If you want my full name, I might tell you later. I am one of the pastors here at the church, and I have the great privilege of actually being the pastor to the middle schoolers, um, which I wholeheartedly believe is the best job at the church because it means I get to come up with stupid games and watch them play them and laugh a lot, which is one of the great joys in life. Um, secondly, at the church, I actually have another kind of job at the church where I am the director of community engagement. And the way I like to explain that to people is that it's my job to help you at the church, so the congregation, those who are members of the Bridge Church, do good in our communities. And I'll tell you this, this year has been an insane year to have that job, as you can imagine. I have talked to people from the health department. I've talked to people from All Faiths Food Bank. I have made phone call after phone call after phone call after phone call, trying to see how we as a church can do good in this crazy, ridiculous season. And one of the things I love to say during these phone calls, because I don't know most of the time if I'm talking to a Christian or a non-Christian, one thing that I have found that resonates with people, regardless of where they land <laughs> politically, where they land religiously, where they land even socially, is this. What good is a church that doesn't do any good? That really, if the Bridge Church is not known for doing good, how good is the Bridge Church? This is our last week of our series, Loving Like Jesus in a Hurting World. And what I want to do is answer two questions today. The two questions are this, who is my neighbor and how do I love them? And this is fundamental to us as a church. That how we answer those questions is going to define who we are as Christians in our communities. Because the Lord Jesus says this in John 13. Jesus says... He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are to love one another. By this, here's the key, by this all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. Jesus himself says this, the way that people are going to know whether or not we are disciples of Jesus, whether or not we are followers of Jesus, comes down to how we love others. In the context of John 13, it starts in the church, loving us as believers, loving and caring for each other, but it must and it has to pour out into the world. That as we wrap up loving like Jesus in a hurting world, I want us to see, be able to answer these questions. I want all of us in here to be able to answer these two questions when we leave. Who is my neighbor and how do I love them? Because if we can't answer those questions, how is the world going to know that we're following Jesus? Let's pray. Father God, you are good and you're wise. I thank you for that. So Lord Jesus, I pray that as we look at your word and as we open your word, that Lord God, that you speak. So Lord Jesus, I pray that right now that you speak, that right now that you move with power and with might. Keep me out of the way today. I love you, Jesus, and praise you. To your name I pray. Amen. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10 today, starting in verse 25, and it says this. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? So here's what's happening. A lawyer comes to Jesus and asks him a question. And it's a really good question, actually. And really, if you're going to ask anybody this question, it should be Jesus. And he says to him, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? We're going to find out in just a few verses that his motive in asking this wasn't the purest. Verse 26, then Jesus responds with a question, which he often does. I notice that if I respond to my wife with a question, so when, he asks, when she asks me a question, I get in trouble. So I try to not be like Jesus in that sense. Verse 26 says, and he said to him, what is written in the law, and how do you read it? Jesus asked him, well, how do you read the law? How do you understand it? In verse 27, the lawyer gives an answer, and he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. It's actually amazing. This guy gives a fantastic answer. His answer actually mirrors the answer Jesus gives to another lawyer in Matthew 22 when he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answers with the exact same verse. 
And it's beautiful because this idea of loving God with all of our heart is this idea of all of our emotions and our deepest convictions are for him. They're, po- they're postured for him. That our soul is this immaterial part of our being. It's going to go on after these bodies that we have wrought away. The mind is this idea of reason. And the strength in the idea of loving God is loving God with all of our abilities and talents and strengths. All in all, the idea of loving God like this is loving God fully and completely with every fiber of our being. And he also says that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, Jesus responds to the man. He said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But then in verse 29, the lawyer responds with a question. But he, desiring to justify himself, and real quick, this is the motive that the lawyer has. He wants to justify himself before Jesus. He wants to justify the way he lives life, the way that he takes these great commandments and interprets them. He wants Jesus to, con- to affirm that the way he interprets them are correct. And here's what he says. And Jesus, in the... You have answered correctly, do this and you will live. And he said, desiring to justify himself. He said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And here's what he's really getting at. He's really asking, who isn't my neighbor? He's asking, who can I not love? He's saying, these people are in my community, I want to love them. These people are in the outskirts of my community, I want to love them. But these people that aren't in my community... Do I have to love them? Like, do they count in this? And for us as Christians, the way that we answer this question is going to be fundamental to who we love and how we love them. Because I'm going to to be honest with you, and I'm guilty of this as well. Too many of us have this posture where we ask the question, who's my neighbor? And what we're really asking is, who can I get out of loving? Who is it that I don't have to love in the same way that I get to love the people that are easy to love? And then Jesus starts telling a parable. And it's interesting because Jesus doesn't directly answer the man's question, but in telling this parable, he does answer it. But what Jesus does, he responds to the question, who is my neighbor, by showing the man and showing us what a good neighbor looks like. Jesus replied, verse 30, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Just real quick on this, and we'll get back to that verse in a moment. Here's what we know about this man. He was a human. That's it. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man that fell among robbers? He said to him, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. The first question we're going to answer today is the question of who is my neighbor? If we bounce back to verse 30, I believe that we can start getting the answer to that question. Verse 30 says this, Jesus replied, a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half for dead. Here's the image that Jesus gives us. He gives us the image of a man who has just jumped and robbed. And the way that Jesus describes him, he describes him as beaten and naked. So here, and he's also unconscious. So when the Samaritan comes to the man, all he sees is that that is a human. When the priest comes to that man, all he sees is that is a human. When the Levite comes to that man, all he sees that is a human. Because here's what we don't know about this man, and here's what the people who walked by likely did not know about him. They didn't know his race. 
Chances are his face was swollen to the point that he didn't look like much of anything. They didn't know his culture. His clothes were stripped off of him. How are you supposed to know where he's from if he's not wearing the, 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 what is accustomed to the area that he's supposed to be from? And he's unconscious, so there's no way to understand what his beliefs are. There's no way to understand that if he votes the same way. There's no way to understand that if he believes the same things. There's no way to understand if he has some wonky convictions that are different than your convictions or their convictions. All he saw was a human. And that should be enough. The reason why that should be enough is because of the doctrine of Imago Dei. The doctrine of Imago Dei simply means this. It's that you and I, all human beings, are created in the image of God. If we go back to Genesis 1, we see that Genesis 1 is a chronological story of creation. And then we flip the page to Genesis chapter 2, and we see that the story is the same story, but it's told in a different way. It's told in a different way because the author wanted to make it clear that man was the peak of all of creation. There's nothing in creation worth more than a human being. Absolutely nothing. The reason being is because only human beings are made in the image of God. Amen. That's it. And the doctrine of the Mago Dei is this. It's that we are made in the image of God. That all humans are made in the image of God. That we have a higher value as humans intrinsically than anything else in creation because we are the ones who bear the image of God. And because of that, all humans are made equal in dignity value, and worth. So the question is, who is my neighbor? And we as Christians, our answer needs to be, my neighbor is every human being. Everyone. And that a robust understanding of Imago Dei plays, played out is that we as people, as Christians, most of all as Christians, we are willing to assign dignity to even the worst humans. We are willing to hold those who are enemies as if they're valuable. We must be willing to those who do not believe what we believe, those who are against us, we must be willing to know that they're worth something. And church, hear me. If we actually walk this out, if we believe that man is created in God's image, and we believe that because of that, every human being has worth and dignity and value, we will stand out in the culture. This is the kind of the foundational to this idea of loving other people. It's a lot harder to love someone when you don't think they're worth something. It's a lot harder to love people, and for myself as well, when we spend time dehumanizing them. Because I'll be honest, I know I do it, so I'm sure you do it. That when I see things on the news, if I read things on Twitter, if I see people in person that just don't look what I think is good, that don't look like what the ideal human in my head should look like, or maybe they're propagating something I don't believe in, it's really easy for me to do Basically what it seems clear that the Samaritan, the, the Levite and the priest did is to take that human being and start subtracting things from them. Start saying, oh, they don't believe what I believe. And in our minds and our hearts, it means we start valuing them less. Or they don't look the way that they should look. Or their skin color is different than mine. Or... They live or they're from somewhere that I don't want anything to do with them. And when we look at humans, our fellow humans, as anything less than the image bearers of God, it's really easy to not love them. I'm, I, this, is, this is one of the things that God really pressed on my heart the past few days. It's a lot easier to not love people when I'm cutting them down. It's a lot easier to value people less when I find all their flaws in them, and I'm glad to point them out. That for you and I as Christians, and if you're not a Christian in here, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry that we as Christians are known for a lot of times for valuing people less than what they're worth. I'm sorry we've done a bad job at this at times. I'm sorry that I've done a bad job at this at times. But church, the question is, who is my neighbor has to be answered, and we have to hold fast to it, and we have to believe it. My neighbor is any other human being because they're an image bearer of God just like I am. And beyond that, there's something beyond that for you and I as Christians. Our Lord, who we follow in love, died for them too. The blood of Christ is available to all of us. All of us. Forgiveness and redemption is available to all of us. Moving on, the next question is this. Well, how do I be a good neighbor? And I believe we can find three things in this text. Three things in this text that will show us what it looks like to be a good neighbor. The, the three things that the Samaritan does. Starting in verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. The first, point, the first kind of point of how to be a good neighbor is this. We must have compassion over indifference. It was easy for the priest, it was easy for the Levite to walk, see that man, and maybe they had some sympathy. Maybe they thought, that stinks. I feel bad for him. And once they were done with that, they said, well, I don't want to get blood on me, so I'm going to the other side of the road, I'm going to get around him. But what the Samaritan does is the Samaritan has compassion. And compassion is this idea of not just sympathy, but empathy. This is, I see your suffering, and I choose to suffer with you. That word compassion shows up just a few times in the New Testament. One of the times it shows up is in Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus looks out at a city, and he describes them as helpless and harassed, like sheep without a, pa- without a pastor or a shepherd. And the Bible teaches us that Jesus had compassion on them. Another time it's used when Jesus encounters a group of blind men. And the Bible says that as he is rubbing, it's kind of gross, like dirt and spit in their eyes. Something we not do in 2020, like for sure. <laughs> but the Bible teaches us, like ugh, spit. Um, <laughs> is it just me or is spit extra gross this year? <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> but the same word compassion is used there where Jesus as he's healing these men he has compassion for them so the first thing we must do if we're going to love our neighbors is we have to have compassion over indifference when I was thinking about a story to explain this um, one of the guys in my men's group came to mind his name's Darren and Darren's this guy who is loves, loves, loves his Bible and is not a hard man, but he's definitely a really a kind of a strict man the way he lives his life. It's beautiful how he lives his life. But I know this one thing my friend Darren does every week is he goes and he volunteers at Pregnancy Solutions. And he volunteers at Pregnancy Solutions, this branch of Pregnancy Solutions called Rookie Dads. And what he does is he goes and he gives up an hour of his week to try to mentor some dudes who got a girl pregnant instead of running away and said, I want to try to be a dad. I want to try to be a good dad. That's compassion over indifference. Darren's saying, those dudes are worth something, so I'm going to show up for them. That's not just Darren thinking, I feel bad for them. That's Darren thinking, I feel bad for them, and I'm going to show up and I'm going to help them. The next point we see, um, the next part of loving our neighbors is this idea of inconvenience for the good of others. And here's how we see it in the Samaritan. And he went to him and he bound up his wounds, verse 34, pouring on oil and water and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And this is funny. I have taught this text before and I've read this text a million times and I never noticed this next part before. And the next day, He took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I'll repay when I come back. The Samaritan stayed with him overnight. He took care of the guy all night. But we can see the Samaritan was obviously on a journey. He takes the time to get off his whatever he's riding on, to load the man up on his animal. Before that, he bounds his wounds. You know what he likely bound his wounds with? 
his own clothing. He pours oil and wine, gives the man oil and wine out of his own supply. And then instead of just dropping the man off and taking off, he stays. Part of loving our neighbors means sometimes we're going to be inconvenienced. Sometimes we're going to be knocked off track. Sometimes we're going to end up doing things we did not want to do. But part of loving our neighbor is, is being inconvenienced for the good of others. When I was thinking about inconvenience, I think of—this is going to sound funny, but I think of some of our— um, so I'm a student pastor. I think I told you that. I know I did. Um, and I just think of some of, the, some of our volunteers or people who work full-time jobs and are also parents. And um, it's pretty inconvenient to give up a night of your week. It's pretty inconvenient to give up two hours and ends up being closer to three hours some nights because some small groups meet way too long. But um, in the middle of your week, in order to serve other people. But I'll tell you this. I'll tell you two things. If there's no part of your week regularly where it feels like a little bit of inconvenience for the good of others, you might want to look into that. And secondly, I know this, and I know this because I have leaders who have told me this over the years. Often enough, those inconveniences turn into the highlight of our weeks. The best part of our weeks. Finally, we see that the Samaritan was able, was willing, and <laughs> was willing to pay up. Verse 35, and the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him and whatever you more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Think of it this way. This is like he walked into the innkeeper, handed him 300 bucks, and told the man, hey, if it comes back and the bill's $1,000, I'll pay it. Because the Samaritan would have known this. If the man was left there, and say he had enough, enough money stocked up to pay for two nights, but then he stayed a third night and a fourth night and didn't pay, he could be brought, he could be taken and sold into slavery he could be brought, in a sense, to what is really what should be called as debtor's prison. And then he had to have to be a enforced servitude to pay off his debt. And the Samaritan, knowing better, made sure that that man was going to have more than enough to cover his stay. To cover any food he ate. To cover any care he received. The loving people was worth the cost. I originally was going to call this um, people were worth spending money on. But that sounded weird. And even just saying it out loud now, I was like, that did sound weird, so I'm glad I didn't say that. <laughs> and I did say it, and that's funny. Um. <laughs> but loving people, what I, loving, pe loving people is worth the cost. And the idea of cost here is, yes, money. But it's also time, and it's also talents. Like, do you know there's people who show up here every week now it's, it's later than it used to be, but it's 7 in the morning to set stuff up. And you know how much money those people make to do that? None. And so I just know for me, like this morning, my alarm went off at 5.45, and I thought to myself, I don't want to get out of bed. And I have an easy job. Well, in a sense, I kind of have an easy job today. I didn't have to be here for set up. But there's people who show up every week despite what it costs them, and they help. I also think of the teacher gifts that we got to do as a church. All in all, we got to give away about a, over 150 of these water bottles that had all these cool things in them, and also these $25 gift cards. And I will tell you, because I'm the dude who, like, talked to those schools, set those things up, it's amazing how happy the principals are at those schools because we did that as a church. And I'm going to give you a little, I'm going to tell you a little secret, and I might get in trouble for this. It ended up costing us a lot of money. But my friends, it was worth it. Because this week we got multiple emails and multiple phone calls from teachers just describing how thankful they are that they had that on their desk when they showed up Monday morning. One teacher told us that she was sitting there at the end of the day with tears in her eyes because it was just such a hard first day. And that's when she saw that water bottle. Oh, that to me, that's worth every penny. 
Because that person knows that there's a church that loves them. That person knows there's a church that loves them that doesn't even know them. That's worth the cost. Because my friends, when we look at the cross, we can see that Jesus did all these things for us. Jesus could have easily had indifference and not cared about us. The Bible actually describes you and I as enemies to God, apart from his grace. But Jesus, when he hangs on the cross, it's amazing. He says seven things. One of the things he says is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's compassion. That's compassion played out, and he did that for you. He did that for me. You want to talk about inconvenience? Imagine being part of the Trinity, God himself, and you step into creation. Philippians describes in Philippians 2, as Jesus took upon human form, he humbled himself, he humbled himself to the form of a servant. So he humbled himself lower and lower and lower. He humbled himself to the point of obedience, even obedience of death on a cross. Oh man, that's inconvenience for the good of others. And he did that for you. He did that for me. And when we can talk about loving people is worth the cost, well, Jesus definitely believed that because it cost him his life. And he did that because he loves you. He did that because you're worth something. Um, during this series, Josh has been talking about this idea of having a one. Having one person you are praying for, one person that you're seeking to share the gospel with. And I just know, if I've put this on myself, I have like a, I have more than one. But I'm going to look at my one a little bit differently this week. I'm going to keep praying for them. But I'm also going to find a way to have compassion for them. I'm going to find a way to, to enter into the pain they're, self, they're experiencing right now. And that might just be a phone call. And that might just be the question, hey, how's your mom doing? That might just be the question, hey, how's your marriage? But I'm going to do my best to enter into their pain to have compassion for them. I'm going to be willing to be inconvenienced, inconvenienced this week. I'm going to do my best. And that might mean I schedule a lunch with someone on a day where I should not leave the office. That might mean that I make a phone call on my way home instead of listening to the podcast I really want to finish. Which, how silly is that? There's times when I don't make a phone call I should make because I want to finish a podcast. But I need to make sure I'm inconvenienced this week for my one. And I'm curious what it might cost me this week. Maybe it'll cost me a phone call. Maybe it'll cost me a couple of phone calls. Maybe it'll cost me a coffee. Truth is, it's not going to cost me much. But here's what I want to challenge you to do, church. Whoever your one is, next week invite them to church and offer to buy them lunch. Say to them, hey, I'd love for you to come and join my family at church. And afterwards... You can pick the restaurant, just, maybe you shouldn't say that. (laughs) And we'll pay for it. My family will pay for it. And I'll be honest with you, and even, and like, hey, I'm a, (laughs) I'm on a church staff. My wife and I aren't rolling in cash. But the reality is, that's not that much, much of a cost. It really isn't that much of a cost. So church, as um, we're wrapping up now, I just want to pray. I want to pray that you and I, we as a church, love our community well. I want to pray that you and I, myself, I desperately need this. I'm going to be honest with you. I desperately need to learn how to be more compassionate. And I want to pray that for you. And if today you don't know Jesus, You don't know how he had compassion for you. Maybe it's the first time you ever heard that he had compassion for you. Maybe it's the first time you ever heard that he gave up his life for your sake. It's really easy to put your trust in Jesus. 
Romans 10 says this, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. That's all you have to do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are good and you are kind. I thank you for that. So Lord Jesus, I pray for myself and my friends here and online. God, that you make us a compassionate people. Lord God, help us know who our neighbors are and help us have deep convictions about that. And Lord God, help us be compassionate. And Lord Jesus, I pray for anybody today that does not know you. I pray that today is the day of salvation. And Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that you love us. And Jesus, I thank you so much that to trust in you is simple. It's simply turning to you and saying, Jesus, I am a sinner. And I need you to be my savior. And Jesus, I want to put my trust in you. I put my trust in you as my Lord as well. Because remember, Romans says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. There's nothing sweeter. Jesus, I love you and I praise you. It's your name I pray. Amen. My friends, if today was a day where you trusted in Jesus, we want to know. And to do that, it's really, really simple. You simply just text the phone number 941-909-3376. And if you trust in Jesus today, text the word believe to that phone number. And if you trusted in Jesus today, I want to say this to you. I am so glad you're part of the family now. And church, if you have any prayer needs, that same phone number, you can just text the word pray. Because we want to make sure as a staff and as a group of volunteers that we are praying for you. 